former Prime Minister of Israel, Golda Meir, is currently visiting this country on behalf of Israel Bonds and the UJA on the occasion of the 25th anniversary of the launching of Israel Bonds. And by the way, this is Mrs. Meir's only uh, network television interview. And we welcome you to our country and to our program. It's Thank you very much. You again, Mrs. Meir. Uh, you say racism was equated with Zionism. Then you must also say that Zionism is equated with Jews. And what they did at the UN was to give a legal stamp to anti-Semitism, to call it by its right name. And that's, that's serious. There are anti-Semites in the world. And now it's been legalized. And of course, if you say that Zionists are racist, that Israel is a racist state, then it's almost uh, necessary to destroy that state. I mean, it has given legal sanction, one, for anti-Semitism, which affects every Jew in, in the world, and two, for anything that the Arab countries may want to do against Israel. This was an interview in 1976, very shortly after the UN had passed its Zionism is Racism uh, resolution. And I began with it, I begin with it because it seems so current today. Even today, Israel feels that it, uh, the UN has been prejudiced against it, particularly recently the UNESCO. And even today, we hear terms like racism connected with Israel. Uh, and certainly, anti-Semitism has gotten much broader throughout the world. There's legitimate criticism of Israel, but racism is not one of the legitimate criticisms. But I began with this because Golda Meir, who lived now, it seems, long ago, is so much still a part of our lives today, so still relevant to our lives today. At the same time, she was very much part of her own era, her own generation. And it was because of that combination of today and then that I spent more than eight years of my life researching and writing and interviewing people in connection with Golda Meir. There have been books about her, there have been shows about her, there was a television show years ago, there was a Broadway play, there was a, um, a, a movie about her with Ingrid Bergman. There have been things about her before, but I felt that she was not given her due, she was not given the kind of depth and breadth uh, that needed to be done in connection with her life. And I also particularly felt that now, 40 years after her death, we could have a little perspective of time looking back, who was this woman and what did she mean to our lives today and our lives then? Well, most of you probably remember her more or less as she looked in that film, you know, a little old lady who uh, didn't look like anything very spectacular, uh, but it could be a nice bubba, as my eye doctor said to me this morning. But in fact, she was a very complex person. She was, in many ways, a bundle of contradictions. She was a woman who was an insider in her country in many ways. She worked her way up in Israel, pre-Israel. Uh, she became labor minister, foreign minister, prime minister. But she was also an outsider in a number of ways. She was a woman in a world that was very much run by men back then. And she came from the United States. She was born in Kiev, in Russia, of course. But she came to pre-state Israel, to man British mandatory uh, Palestine, from the United States. She was the only one of the leaders of that time who came from a country where Jews were not being persecuted, a country where your parents or your grandparents, like mine, uh, could really have many opportunities to succeed. She would have had, with her talents and her abilities, many opportunities also to succeed. I think sometimes maybe she would have become our first woman president. Maybe not. But she left all that, and she joined this group of men who were, as I say, all from Eastern Europe. So she was an insider, but she was also an outsider. Another contradiction. She was a female, a woman icon in a way. She was a very modern woman in some ways. Uh, she had been married, separated. She never divorced, but separated from her husband. She had lovers. 
She uh, became a single mother with raising two children herself. She always worked. So she seemed so modern and the kind of woman women today might be looking up to. But she was very opposed to the women's movement of the 1970s. That's not to say that she didn't look out for women. She cared about women's issues. For example, on a lighter note, in, when the State of Israel was just being formed, when it had just begun, there were a spate of rapes in various big cities that was very, became dangerous. And so the uh, men in the uh, legislature, to, in their wisdom, said that there had to be curfews for women to keep them out of danger. And Golda Meir said, it's the men who are doing the raping. They should have the curfews. <laughs> but when she became, on a more serious note, when she became labor minister, she really pushed through, I mean, pushed through against a lot of opposition, laws protecting women, particularly protecting women, working women. A working women, when they had babies, would get free hospitalization. There was paid maternity leave, something we still do not have in our country today. So she did care about women's issues, yet she opposed the women's movement in the 1970s. Those crazy bra-burning women, she said. Now part of that, part of her opposition, had to do with her own view of what society should be. She was a socialist, and she really felt that under socialism, was a blanket. Everybody would be protected. You didn't need any separate movements for women or anybody else. So there was, she opposed that kind of a movement. But she was also an ambitious woman. And it was not, uh, not the right thing for her at that time, uh, in her the, the desire to advance, to identify with the women's movement. I kind of am critical of her about that, uh, because she could have, it wouldn't have hurt her, but even today, even today, women, powerful women, do not identify themselves as feminists. It's easier not to do that. Another contradiction. She was a woman who was um, not educated, very poorly educated. She, went, uh, she had a high school degree. She went to one year of normal school and then dropped out because she was very involved in her Zionist activities. And yet, she could speak to any audience without notes, without having written out her talk, and so beautifully, so uh, touchingly that it would reach people's hearts and they would just go crazy for her, even though she did not have a highfalutin vocabulary. Her, her colleagues would say she could read pages from the phone book and have people in tears in no time. Another contradiction. She was a grandmotherly looking woman, like we saw on the screen, or like many of our memories of her. A Yiddish mama, people said. And she played up that image. She liked that image. She, when she was interviewed at one time, and she spoke about her uh, chicken soup recipe, thousands of people wrote in to get that recipe. I put it in my book because of that, but don't bother. It's just not very good. <laughs> But this same motherly, grandmotherly woman uh, with her, you know, her hair back and her crinkly eyes and her dumpy figure could be tough as nails. She could be cruel. She could be sarcastic uh, when people disagreed with her. Uh, and she could be difficult. I interviewed someone, you may have heard his name, named Nyasi Sarid, who was a statesman in Israel. And he had worked for Golda when he was a young man. And he said that when he had to go in to see her, particularly if he disagreed with her, he would stand in front of the mirror and straighten his shoulders and look into the mirror and say, you can do it, Yossi, you can do it. And then he would go see her and his heart would be beating anyway. Another, another contradiction about Golda, probably the most serious. She is, was and is revered in the United States, still is revered for the most part, and other countries of the world. But she became, in her own country, a controversial figure. She was very popular, and then she became controversial. She became controversial for partly, uh, it was misogyny, it was a sexism. These young men like Yossi Sarid, who had worked for her when they were young, uh, were now no longer young, but she had died, sort of took out the, all their anger at her, and 
things like, you know, a woman who had been uh, uh, self-assertive became self-righteous. Uh, terms that we often hear connected uh, with women when they're wanting to be insulted. But that's only part of it. The other part of it is that she became uh, controversial because of the Yom Kippur War. And I'm going to talk about that a, a little you know, later. But uh, that war, and that was a war in which Israel was taken by surprise by Syria and Egypt. And Golda Meir was the prime minister at the time. And so she was held responsible. And as I say, I'm going to discuss it more later. But that is an, a very large contradiction in her life. Her life story reads like fiction. She was born in Kiev in 1898. Her older sister, Shana, was nine years older than she. Between her birth and the birth of uh, uh, and Shana's birth, her parents gave birth to four uh, babies, all of them boys, all of them who died in infancy. So her birth, her arrival on the scene was very much welcomed until her younger sister arrived, and she was kind of pushed aside at that time. In 1906, she and her mother and her sisters went, immigrated to, to Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Her father had gone ahead of them, which was sort of the way things were in those days. Now, I thought about that a lot. You people live here in Stanford, but so many people uh, that many of us know grew up in New York City or Chicago or the very large cities in the tenements in the slums of those cities. So what was different about her, her, well, her uh, growing up uh, uh, period? You know, in those days, there, as we all know, there were waves of Jewish immigrants coming uh, to the United States in the early 1900s and a little bit later. And they were from Eastern Europe. Earlier, in the, 18, in the 1880s, there had been waves of German Jewish immigrants who came. The German Jews, by the time the East European Jews came, the German Jews were more or less assimilated, were Americanized, and while they started philanthropies to care for the East European Jews, they really looked down on them to a great extent. They saw them as uncouth, as dirty, and so they were not happy when waves of East European Jews settled in large cities in, in, en masse in New York or, or Chicago or other large cities. And so they wanted to spread them out around the country. They wanted to Americanize them, and they didn't want them seen as this block of, of Jews, uh, uncouth, uncouth Jews in one place. And so there were organizations that were set up to convince these immigrants to move out west. And for the most part, it didn't work very well. But it did work with Moshe Mababitz, Golda's father. And because of that, she did not grow up in this dark tenements of New York. The family was very poor, and they lived within the ghetto of Milwaukee. Nevertheless, Milwaukee was a very progressive city. It was a socialist city with a socialist mayor. And Golda had joined the Polizion, which was a socialist Zionist organization. She, that was reinforced by this socialist mayor and this background. But even more than that, Milwaukee was close to the frontier in those days. Uh, it was more open. Even though they were poor, there was a touch of green, a porch here or there. Uh, it was a kind of openness that other, uh, immigrants didn't, other Jewish immigrants did not have. There was, on this frontier area, a can-do atmosphere. You know, you work hard enough, and you really put all your all into it, and you will achieve what you want to achieve. And that became very much Golda's philosophy. And then there was this optimism of a growing nation, and Golda imbibed that. All her life, she spoke of herself as an optimist. A Jew, she would say, does not have the luxury of not being an optimist. Now, Golda went to live for a while in Denver, where her sister had moved. And in Denver, she met a man named Morris Meyerson. Morris Meyerson was a sign painter, but he was very cultured from Golda's point of view. He, he loved music. He loved art. He loved literature. And she was very taken with him. And Morris was, fell in love with Golda. She was 16, and he was 21. His mother came to visit at one point, <clears throat> to meet the Mabovitz family, Golda's family. And I have letters. I, I, much of what I did was try to get a lot of original material. And I have letters uh, from one of Morris's sisters to another sister, in which she says that their mother, 
did not think very highly of the mob of its family. Not only that, she did not think that this Golda was good enough for her son, Morris. So Golda and Morris got married. They moved to a, a British mandatory Palestine. They lived in a kibbutz for a while. Morris never quite made it. He tried this, he tried that, he ran a store. Whatever he did, he kind of failed at. He loved his music. You know, he wasn't able to quite make it as a, a, a living. Golda Meir, of course, became Golda Meir, the Golda Meir we know. So I say this to critical mothers-in-law, just be careful. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, you have to know Golda's names because people always mix them up. She was Golda Mabovitz, her birth name. She was Golda Meyerson, her married name, and she was Golda Meyerson for a very long time, right through her time as labor minister, and then when she was foreign minister, Ben-Gurion convinced her, or really insisted, that she Hebraicized her name and um, she became Golda Meir, the Golda Meir that we all know. Morris and Golda and their friends made Aliyah. They went up to live in Palestine in 1921. And that was another thing that I thought about. What did they know? What did these young people know about this land that they were going to? Well, they had read books about it, but, and they knew it was going to be hard, but they didn't know how harsh living would be there. They didn't know how much of that land was desert and sands and how difficult it would be to build on that. But even more difficult and more complicated, they knew there were other people living there. They knew there were Arabs living there. But they really believed and truly believed that after a while, the Arabs would come to accept them because after all, they were bringing Western ways. They were bringing their know-how with them and they would be helping the Arabs and they felt for sure they would end up living in peace together. Well, the Arabs weren't interested in the culture that they brought and as we know, that was a mistake. The other mistake that they made was at that time, there was a Yiddish cyst movement in the United States uh, particularly in this, among Zionist groups, which was to study Yiddish. That Yiddish was the language of the Jewish people. And so Golda and her friends, even though they grew up speaking Yiddish, began writing to each other. They always spoke English to each other, but they began writing to each other in Yiddish uh, and speaking to each other in Yiddish. Well, then Golda, uh, when they went to uh, Palestine, they discovered, of course, that Hebrew was the language of the Jewish people in Palestine and in Israel, that Hebrew was this exciting language that was being rediscovered, and she didn't know that language. They lived, she and Morris, as I say, lived in a kibbutz at the beginning, and Golda very quickly showed some of her leadership qualities, and so uh, she was sent to various conferences. She went to a conference in Tel Aviv, and she spoke in Yiddish, and okay. And then she went to a conference in Deganya, which was the first uh, um, kibbutz, the first agricultural settlement set up in Palestine. And as she began speaking, uh, one of the pioneers in the audience, a Hebraist, stopped her and he said, no, it's bad enough you spoke Yiddish in, Dega in, in Tel Aviv, but in Deganya, no. And she was humiliated. She had to go on in Yiddish because she didn't know Hebrew. Well, she of course learned Hebrew, it became her language, but she was never proficient in Hebrew. She was not good in Hebrew, as good as she had been in English, for example. And you know, Abba Iban, the very educated Abba Iban, would say about her, okay, so she has a limited vocabulary of 2,000 words. Why doesn't she at least use those words? And Golda got back at him because when she was told that he, Abba Iban, who was, as I say, very educated, spoke five languages, she said, well, so does the waiter at the King David Hotel. <laughs> Golda and Morris lived in Kibbutz Merchavia for a while, Merchavia, and Morris hated it. He hated communal life, and they moved to Jerusalem. Golda wanted to be a good wife. They had two children in Jerusalem. They were so poor. Some of you may have heard that. They were so poor that Golda took in the laundry of the local nursery school, using her washboard uh, to wash the diapers and, and whatever else there was. But then in 1931, this was the late 1920s, in 19, uh, early 1930s, she was offered a position by a man named David Remes, who would later become 
her lover, and I believe the true love of her life. He, but he offered her a position to become, to become involved and later the head of the Women Workers' Council uh, in uh, Palestine. The Women Workers' Council was the women's division of the Histadrut. The Histadrut was the Jewish Labor Federation. And uh, David Remes was very high up. He was a very important person in the Histadrut. And the American counterpart of the Women Workers' Council was the pioneer women, that is today Naamat. And so Golda began working with these women and uh, worked her way up there and became head of, of uh, the, the pioneer women and the Women Workers' Council. And she worked very hard. She traveled back and forth, back and forth between uh, Palestine and the United States. These women were not wealthy women. They didn't have rooms for her to sleep in. Once she went to a hotel and they were all very angry at her because she spent $7 on a hotel room. So she stayed in their home, slept in their beds because often they didn't even have an extra room for her. But she, she did that for several years. And then she began working her way up in the Histadrut herself, uh, becoming more and more important and central uh, to what was going on there. In 1938, Golda was sent as a, an unofficial delegate to a conference that took place in Avion on the uh, shores of Lake Geneva. This was a conference that Franklin D. Roosevelt called to discuss the situation of the refugees. Those refugees were Jewish refugees. This was a time before the final solution, before the Nazis had decided to kill all the Jews, when Jews were running away from Nazi-controlled countries and were also being thrown out. So there was a, a very serious Jewish refugee problem. And Roosevelt convened 32 nations to discuss what to do about these Jewish refugees. 31 of the 32 nations could not find any space at all for the, refu the Jewish refugees. Either they, well, we filled our quotas of Jews, or there are too many professionals, we don't want that many professionals, or we just don't like Jews. One nation, the Dominican Republic, offered the Jews the refugee space uh, to till the land in a very untillable area where the land was very bad. And Golda sat at this and listened to this. And at the end, there was a, a news conference. And she said at the news conference, I'm going to read it to you, there was one, only one thing I hope to see before I die, and that is that my people should not need expressions of sympathy anymore. And years later, looking back at that conference, she told a young journalist that that conference had been a turning point for her, that she had come to realize that you cannot depend on anyone in the world. Jews cannot depend on anyone in the world. Jews had to depend only on themselves. And that is why they needed a homeland. In 1948, shortly after the partition was declared by the UN in 1947, in 1948, uh, Ben-Gurion, realizing that as soon as the state was going to be declared, the surrounding Arab nations were going to attack it, realizing that they needed money desperately to buy arms, uh, sent somebody to the United States. The United States was now the nation, the Jews of the United States had the most money of the Jews around the world. Uh, and he sent somebody to the United States, an emissary, and this man could raise no more than $7 million, which wasn't going to go very far. And Ben-Gurion was going to go himself, but he couldn't leave at that time. And so he sent Golda, whom he trusted. Golda came to uh, the United States and, and, and to Chicago in the middle of a, a, a snowstorm. It was freezing cold. She had heard that there was a luncheon of Federation people, well-heeled uh, Jewish Federation people in Chicago, and she needed to speak to them. There was a man named Henry Montour, who was the executive director of the UJA at the time. He knew of Golda, he said, only as a schnorrer. You know, she was this woman who used to come to try to raise money. But he didn't know anything else about her. And there she was, he said, she didn't have a dime in her pocket. She walked from her hotel room in the freezing cold to meet him. And she said, listen, I've got to go to that uh, luncheon. So he took a chance. He didn't expect much, but he managed to get her a, a speaking position at the luncheon. And she spoke, and there she was, this woman, even then, already with the part in the middle of her head, her hair pulled back, not a speck of makeup. And she spoke from her heart. And she told them what the situation was. And she ended by saying, 
you cannot make the decision whether we will fight or not. That decision has been taken. We will fight, even if we have to do so with stones. But you, American Jews, can decide whether we will be victorious or the Mufti and the Arabs will be victorious. That decision you can make. And when she finished, as Montour described it, there was an electric current in the room. People were so moved, the tears were running down their eyes, and they stood up, they gave her a standing ovation, and they almost threw their pledges at her. Then, uh, with some of the people of UJA, she traveled around the country to raise money from one city to another, and by the time she was finished, she had raised $50, million, unheard of at that time. There were other incidents in her life that had become well known. She dressed up, some of you may know, as an Arab woman uh, to go meet with the King Abdullah to try to convince him not to join in the war in 48. She failed. He, Jordan did join. Years later, she met with his grandson, Hussein of Jordan, uh, to try to make Swatch land for peace, as it were. Uh, and that didn't work either, but Jordan and Israel became, were, were quite friendly, and Golda was friendly with Hussein. And then there was a well-known incident that I, you, some of you may know and some of you may not. Uh, she became the first ambassador to the Soviet Union, the first Israeli ambassador to the Soviet Union. At that time, nobody knew what the situation was with Soviet Jews. They were what Elie Wiesel called the Jews of Silence. They were repressed. Now, the Soviet Union had uh, accepted and, and backed the idea of, of Israel of partition because for them, it was a way to get into the Middle East. But they saw their Jews as every other group. There was a Soviet man. Everybody was similar. You were faithful to Mother Russia. And, uh, he was, and there were some Jewish organizations, but the Jews, as the most, for the most part, were not encouraged uh, to draw near to Israel. Uh, they were Soviet man or Soviet woman. So Golda was the first ambassador, and uh, she tried very hard to meet with Jews and met very few. But then on, Yom, on Rosh Hashanah, on the New Year's, and Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, she went to the Choral Synagogue in Moscow. And when she came out, thousands upon thousands of Jews came out to greet her. It was like a dam had burst. Golda, they called. Our Golda, they called out. They tried to touch her, to put notes into her pocket. And she was, somebody pushed her into a taxi to save, to, to, just to protect her because there were so many people. And all she could think to do was to put her head out the door, out the window, and say, thank you for having remained Jewish. Golda became very involved in the Soviet movement after the, freeing the Soviet Jews. She spoke openly as prime minister. She did a lot of behind the scenes activities. I met somebody who was very important in the Soviet uh, movement that he said to me, when you write your book, even though she will have been dead by then, in the 1990s, a million uh, Soviet Jews came to Israel. You must write a headline. If it were not for Golda Meir, that would never have happened. Golda became labor minister in 1949, and aside from the women's legislation, she also pushed through very important uh, insurance legislation that led to the social security system that Israel still has today and the kind of welfare state that Israel still has today. <clears throat> and she, did, she, was very, she was responsible for housing for the hundreds of thousands of immigrants who were pouring into uh, Israel then. Uh, she was setting up tents and what they called Mabarot, temporary housing. She herself lived very modestly. And when you think about our leaders today throughout the world, she lived in a, two, a little house, except for her official residences, but when she, her own home was a little house in Ramat Aviv, outside of Tel Aviv, that she shared. One side of it was for her and the other side was for her son and his children. I visited that house. I got to know Golda's children quite well. And by when I visited, her son lived on one side and her daughter lived on the other. That both of them have since died and the grandchildren live in that house now. But it was a tiny little house and the living room was so small. And on one side was a fireplace. Uh, the children now had pictures of Golda and some drawings that people had made. The other side was a couch 
with two soft, soft couch with two soft chairs. And her son, when I asked him, told me she always sat in this chair because it was near the kitchen. And the kitchen was this tiny kitchen with an old-fashioned refrigerator because she would go in and make tea and coffee for guests, whether they were visiting dignitaries from England, most important people, or her friends. That's what Golda liked to do. She became foreign minister uh, in 1956. And she did many things as foreign minister, but one thing to me stands out. She developed, uh, began to develop a very close relationship with the United States that had not existed that way before. President Eisenhower did not have that close feeling that we still have today, with the United, that Israel still has today with the United States. But Golda met with uh, President Kennedy, with, um, uh, not Robert Kennedy, uh, with President Kennedy, or Jack Kennedy, and uh, he had met with Ben-Gurion before her. He didn't like Ben-Gurion very much, but Ben-Gurion didn't like him. Ben-Gurion said, he's just a politician. But Golda was very taken with this young man who had become president of the United States. And he was very taken with this motherly woman. And he said something to her that no president had ever said to any Israeli leader. He said, the United States has a special relationship with Israel that's similar to our relationship with Great Britain. And if Israel is ever attacked, we will be there for her. And that was really, as I say, the beginning. It continued very much with Yitzhak Rabin. And with Yitzhak Rabin, who became Golda's ambassador to the United States, the two of them built up the embassy, Israel's embassy in Washington, that it had so much cloud, it was more important than any other embassy on the row. It was a, and that, con, that closeness, as I say, uh, continued and uh, continues today. Golda became prime minister in 1969. And now I will go back to the Yom Kippur War. The Yom Kippur War broke out in 1973. Golda was the prime minister. Sadat, who was the president of, of Egypt, uh, had been talking about war. He had threatened war. For one thing, people didn't take him seriously. They didn't learn until later that he was a brilliant man. But at that time, he seemed, he kept changing his mind. He seemed sort of buffoonish. But aside from that, Golda was reassured constantly by her generals that one, there was a low, this is the term they always use, there was a low probability of war. It became so, this term was used so often it became the title of a book. There was a low probability of war. It wasn't going to happen. And even if it did happen, Israel would win in, in a minute. Why? Because look what happened in 1967. Israel had won and conquered all that land in, within six days. So there was nothing to worry about. And Gold always had this gut feeling about you know, what would happen. Is there a war? Sadat threatening? No, no, no probability of war. <clears throat> and then about two days before the war did break out, there had word had come that the um, advisors, the Soviet Union's advisors who were in Egypt and Syria, you remember this was the Cold War period, and so Egypt and Syria were, were the clients of uh, Russia, of the Soviet Union, and Israel was the client of the United States. So the advisors that Russia had sent uh, to uh, Egypt and Syria were being rushed out, hurried out en masse. And Golda said, well, why? Why is that happening? Uh, you know, what's wrong? Well, not to worry. Maybe they think that Israel is going to invade. There's nothing to worry about. And Golda had this terrible gut feeling that something was really wrong, but she didn't act on it because her generals had assured her that everything was you know, going to be fine. And then, of course, the war broke out. And Israel lost 2,600 soldiers in that war and thousands of others who were wounded. Israel won the war, as you heard, on one handily in that sense. But there was such a glum feeling, there was such a terrible feeling about that loss, and there was a feeling of vulnerability that can actually continues till today. That war left its impact until today because Israel felt for a while that it was going to lose. And Golda said, I will never again be the person I was before the war. And she blamed herself over and over that she should have acted. She said, all my life I acted on my intuition, and this is one time when I didn't. At the same time, however, Golda, somebody said, somebody who interviewed me said it was also her finest hour, wasn't it? In some ways it was, because Moshe Dayan, the great hero of the Six-Day War, fell apart completely. He really panicked. 
He thought the, the whole nation is going to be destroyed. What are we going to do? He it was, couldn't operate for a while. And Golda held the, na held the nation together, went on uh, television and spoke to the people. She was calm. But even more than that, she made very important military decisions that actually led to the victory. So it was, in that sense, a mixed bag, but she was always very depressed about it. But the people, there would be a protest meeting, a protest against Moshe Dayan that spilled over to Golda. And in 1974, she retired. She resigned, actually. And, but even before she retired, she resigned, and there was a gap period between the time that she gave in her resignation and the time that Yitzchak Rabin, who was going to replace her, would take over. And in that, before, they, before she resigned, she had been negotiating with Henry Kissinger, uh, very hard negotiations about the separation of troops between Egypt and Israel. And they arrived at some agreement that became the basis for the later peace treaty with Egypt that still holds up today. So after she resigned and before she actually retired, she was also negotiating with Kissinger about Syria, the separation of troops with Syria. And it was very hard. I mean, they were really at each other. And finally, some of you may have heard this, Kissinger said, Madam Prime Minister, I am an American first, a Secretary of State second, and a Jew only last. And she said, well, that's OK, Henry. In Hebrew, we read from right to left. <laughs> so. Golda finally did resign completely, but she still remained active. She went back and forth to the United States. She met with President Ford. And when Sadat made his historic visit uh, to Israel in 1977, Golda was there to greet him along with the uh, dignitaries of Israel. And when he came, met her, he said to her, Mrs. Mayor, I have wanted for such a long time to meet you. And she said, well, why didn't you come? And he said, because the time was not, not yet ripe. He needed that war. He needed that war to gain the, the pride that Egypt and the other Arabs had lost in the 67 war. Golda died on December 8, 1978, at the age of 80. And she had been fighting a lymphoma, a terrible lymphoma, for 15 years. Uh, and then she died of it. Now, so who was this woman? Golda Meir had many flaws. She could be rigid, she could be intransigent, she could be sarcastic, as I told you. The uh, Mizrachim, the Jews from uh, Arab lands, were never really liked her because they felt that she so favored the Soviet Jews, even though she tried to help these uh, uh, Jews from Morocco and other countries. Uh, they, she didn't really quite understand them. She certainly never understood Arab uh, nationalism, the Palestinian nationalism nor did almost anybody else at that time. In fact, many of the Palestinians themselves had not yet seen themselves as a nation. Uh, they were, for the most part, the world dealt with Egypt and Syria and the, the other nations rather than with the Palestinians. Uh, and, uh, that was, and she totally did not understand them. Nevertheless, she was a leader and she was a person with a vision. And now, is Aaron here? Who is Aaron? Oh, here you are. Okay, I want you to hear Golda tell you about her vision herself. Do you have any words of wisdom for other people who have retired and find themselves in perhaps a similar position to yours? Well, I have no words of wisdom. All I can say is that every person should find the thing in life which is most vital to him outside of his own family life. But in addition to that, there must be something that uh, one wants in the world. You know, in Hebrew, the word cholem, the dreamer, and the word lochem, the fighter, have exactly the same letters. Only one, one place they change, but the same letters. And I've interpreted, and I'm not a Hebrew scholar, that only one who dreams a great dream finds that's important enough and sometimes essential to fight for the realization of that dream. I pity people that don't have dreams, great dreams of great things to come and that believe in them. I believe that the fate of my people depends upon sovereignty is reestablished. Mrs. Mayer, at 78, you still have your dreams and 
Perhaps that's the secret of your greatness. Golda gave up much of her private life, her family life, her health for her dream. She had a great dream. And I think we could all agree that she realized that dream, her homeland for the Jewish people. Thank you very much. Well, the, how would Golda relate to the settlers today? Uh, which, in your point of view, he, Buddha's on racism, I'm not going to discuss that, but I will tell you this. She would, not be, she would not be in favor of the extent of settlers today. Golda was not somebody who believed in a greater Israel, that it, Israel had to settle and own all of the land. She did not want to go back to the 67 borders because she felt they were unsafe. And so she felt that that's why she wanted to trade land for peace. She foresaw them as, as bargaining chips, and she wanted to use those bargaining chips to get a better deal for Israel, to get better borders for Israel. But she was absolutely opposed, absolutely opposed to settling in um, dense areas that were densely populated by Arabs. Uh, and she spoke about that very frequently. Uh, and she also said that, she, it's not that she loved you know, the Arabs or the Palestinians, she was so much a, a Jewish leader, but she said, if, if we were to live in those, if we were to take in thousands and thousands of uh, Palestinians within our state, we would have to give them exactly the same rights we have. And it would be a very difficult situation, a very difficult demographic situation. So she would have been opposed to that. I also would point out that Golda was in, uh, in the Labor Party, right? And uh, she was not in the Likud. Uh, she was opposed to the to, to Likud. She was a laborite. She was a socialist. Yes. How would Golda relate to Haredim today? You're getting all <laughs> you're getting all the negatives here. Um, she here's the thing. She no no. She would not. Again, she tried. Actually, she tried uh, to have women way back. She passed the bill before she was prime minister. I think she was the foreign minister then. Or she wanted to get a bill passed to have Haredi women serve in the army. Well, that didn't go over. But then she said, that have them do just service. And there was such an outcry. I mean, eventually there was a law passed, but there was such an outcry uh, you know, against her for having, just saying that oh, religious women should, should do some service for the country. Uh, that uh, she was furious about it. So she would n not be that sympathetic uh, to the Haredim, uh, to, to the, uh, particularly don't serve in the army. On the other hand, I will say this, Golda was a consummate politician. So even when she opposed things, I mean, I was always amazed. She would oppose something, and then the next thing you know, you know, those people are in the cabinet uh, because they had to put together, you know, cabinets in those days. Uh, so, but she would, she would certainly not be sympathetic to the Haredim. I'm going to, what were her religious beliefs or non-beliefs? I'm going to give you an answer in one sentence that Golda said. And I think she said this to Hannah Arendt, who had come to write up the um, Eichmann trial. She said, I don't believe in God, but I believe in the people who believe in God. <laughs> so I think that, that says it. I think that says it all. <laughs> The question was, what would be her attitude to using nuclear weapons in the Yom Kippur War, right? Okay. So, um, there were, in, in, there's this, um, in this play, in a, a book similar to that, that the play is based on, the theory was that uh, when Israel was really desperate for arms, they wanted more arms in the Yom Kippur War, that at one point, Simcha Dinitz, who was Golda's ambassador to the United States, uh, threatened Henry Kissinger that if we don't get the arms, uh, we're going to use nuclear weapons. And so um, I, I interviewed Henry Kissinger, among other people. And I don't always believe things that statesmen like that tell you, but in this case, I did believe him. And his answer was, absolutely not, because Israel has maintained, even today, this, uh, the word is opacity, right? They never will say whether they have, should we have our nuclear arms or don't, and in those days they didn't say that, although the United States recognized, knew that they did have those, those, uh, that ability. So he said, were they to threaten us, it would be a very dangerous thing for Israel to do. First place, they, we would have to acknowledge something that they don't, open, they don't openly acknowledge. And then I could never make that decision myself. 
I would have had to take that decision much higher up to the National Security Board, to the President himself. It would have been a very bad thing for Israel. Now, so that's part of the story. Moshe Dayan did suggest using unconventional weapons, and Golda was absolutely opposed to it, and not only Golda, but her cabinet, absolutely opposed to it. However, uh, and, 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 and you know, we're really using them. However, I also interviewed James Schlesinger, who was the Secretary of Defense at that time, who has since died. And he said to me, Diane did something. He said it wasn't going again. It was such a minor thing. He sort of, they had something called Jericho missiles that could hold nuclear warheads. And he, st he positioned them in such a way, and, I, and Schlesinger didn't know, and I didn't know exactly how, in such a way, not to threaten the United States in any way, but that Egypt would understand that, this, that they had something. Because at that time, the word had come that the Soviet Union was beginning to ship nuclear arms, not huge ones, but nuclear arms, to Egypt. And it was that, as Schlesinger said, it was that Diane did the right thing, according to Schlesinger, that Diane was saying, you know, you got, you're getting some nuclear arms? Listen, guys, this is what we have. So that he was, they were threatening Egypt, but in fact, they would never have used them. I mean, I suppose if the state was really about to be totally destroyed, maybe they would have considered it. But they understood. I mean, Golda, even in the fears of the Yom Kippur War, in the worst days, she understood and knew just what Kennedy had said to her, that the United States was not going to let Israel be destroyed. And so they would not have used, it. They would not have used these nuclear arms. That's the, that's the long answer to a short question. Oh, poor Mar. <laughs> Whatever happened to Morris was the question. You know, a friend of mine who read my book and said, you know what, in the end, Morris was a nebbish. But, you know, <laughs> but, you know I don't like to call anybody a nebbish. He was very, he was a wonderful father. When she was away, sometimes she was away nine months at a time. And he would be there, you know, for the children and, and take care of them. So he did that. Uh, he... Uh, I don't know, he, but eventually what happened, and it's very sad, he died in 1951, the same year as David Remes, her lover, died. But Golda was away, she was always away, so she was away, but he died in her home because he was there, there was a, a woman, her son Menachem's first wife's mother, the Menachem got divorced and then married, a terrific woman who I also interviewed, but his first wife's mother was a friend of the family. And while Golda was away, she and Morris were sort of in the house. I mean, they were just sitting and talking, whatever. And he suddenly got a heart attack and died. And when Golda got word of that, she fainted. She was so shocked um, and, and sad. And also, I will say this, that the only photograph Golda ever kept near her bed, or in her home near her, was the photograph of Morris. This is a reminder of her young, younger days and when he was very important to her. Oh, did she speak Russian? No. no. No, she didn't speak Russian. Uh, they spoke Yiddish at home. And when she became the ambassador to Russia in, that, you know, in, in, those, in um, 1948, um, there were criticisms in the country that said, uh, in fact, there were criticisms that said, she doesn't speak Russian, you know, blah, blah, blah. But somebody said to her, some reporter said to her, uh, Mrs. Mayer, why don't you speak Russian? And she said, well, I'll tell you why. I have this habit of not speaking a language I don't know. would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. 
Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, P.O. Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.